This is an interview for the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute with Mr. George Price. I'm Dr. Horace Huntley. It's March 24th, 1995, and we're at Miles College. Mr. Price, thank you for taking your time to come and sit with us this morning to talk about Birmingham and the Civil Rights Movement. Thank you for inviting me. I just want to start by just getting a little, little background information. Tell me a little about your background. Where, where were you born and where, were you, where did you grow up? I was born in Greene County, and at the age of three months old, I was brought to Birmingham. I grew up in Avondale and Woodlawn section of Birmingham, Alabama, mm -hmm. and attended school at Thomas School in Avondale, in the elementary school, and from there to Lincoln School, and from there to Parker. And I uh, was a freshman at Talladega College when I finished Parker High School, but due to the lack of money, I had to come out of school in about three months. So I couldn't go back to school then until I went into the Armed Forces of the United States of America. And when I got out of the Armed Forces of the United States of America, I used my GI Bill a few years later to go back to school to try to complete my education, which I did at Tuskegee Institute in okay. Tuskegee, Alabama. Okay, let me ask you, did you, uh, when you came to Birmingham, did you come with your, your parents? My parents brought me. The my, my, aunt brought me to Birmingham because I was three months old. Okay. And did they remain in, in uh, Utah? My parents mm -hmm. remained in Utah till they death. Mm -hmm. And then you were raised by your aunt here in Birmingham? Right. Mm -hmm. um, so you then know very little about, about Utah and Greene County, Alabama? Very little. Mm -hmm. So you then went through the Birmingham school system and you went on to Talladega College. Yes. From Talladega, you eventually went to Tuskegee. Right. And, and from Tuskegee, what was this after, before you went to the military? I went to Talladega before I went to the military. Okay. But Tuskegee is after I went to the military because I didn't have no money. Mm -hmm. And not having any money, if doubtless had not been for the military service, I wouldn't have been able to go to Tuskegee because I went on the GI Bill. Yeah. How long were you in the military? Four years. Four years. And after you came out of the military, then you went to Tuskegee. What, what was your major? What did you major in in college? General education and business. Mm -hmm. And after you finished Tuskegee, what did you do? What kind of work? I went to work for um, Connor Steel at uh, as an iron inspector for a short period of time. And after that, I left and went to New York to better my condition. And my aunt that I live with, well, after I was in New York, maybe 18 or 19 months, took sick. And they called me, and I came from New York here to see about her. And I was here maybe two weeks, and I went back to my job in New York. And I was there maybe a week and a half, I was called back to come back to see about her. When I came back, she was so sick, put in the hospital, and I just stayed until she died. And I remained in Birmingham then. And I went to work for General Houseware Cooperation. Uh -huh. And I remained with General Houseware then until I retired. What did you do at General Houseware? A welder. A welder. You also um, was a member of the labor union. Right. And what, what company did you work for when you were a member of that labor union? I was a member of the labor union everywhere I worked, Con Steel. Okay. And when I was with uh, uh, McCullough, DuPont, I was with the labor union too. Uh -huh. I've always, uh, wherever I worked, that, uh, if there was a labor union available, I always joined the labor union. Uh -huh. um, one of the labor unions was Mine, Mill, and Smelter Workers. Yes. Can you tell me a little about that organization? How, how active were you involved with it? 
With mine smell of workers, I went from a shop store to vice president in the labor union. Oh, I was a shop store for maybe oh, six months, and from that to a committeeman, and from a, a committeeman to vice president over a period of years. Okay. And I was elected uh, vice president at least three different times. Hmm. Is this in the 50s? Yeah. So is this at the same time that Mine Mill and the Steelworkers Union? No, is, before then. Before they merged? Before they merged. Okay. Uh, so then you knew Asbury Howard? Definitely so. How we were good did friends. You, did you work together? Oh, yeah, you? and uh, negotiating contracts and uh, filing a grievous committee and fighting cases for men and trying to see that people get their fair share of rights when men was fired from their jobs and Asbury Howard and I worked together for a number of years doing this. The Mine Mill and Smelter Works Union organized in Birmingham in 1933 and in the 40s there was a, a big rift between black workers and white workers. Black workers lived and died by Mine Mill. There were some white workers that were also a involved with that. This was prior to your getting involved in the union. Though. Right. Uh, so black workers looked at that union as being more than just a union, but really a way of life because they had um, uh, official positions that was designated for, for black workers. You know, the vice presidents, the recording secretaries, and others. In other words, it was an interracial union. Uh, was it still that way when you were involved in the 50s? Yes, most of it was that way. Uh, I can't think too much had changed in that particular time during the time that I worked for, because the company that I worked for at that particular time was very rude to the workers, and they wasn't really nice as they should have been. So we always had some uproar that we always had to fight for. And we had to call Asbury Howard and being the vice president of Mill Mine Smeller Workers in most cases. And then uh, we had a problem doing contract negotiations, trying to get increases in benefits. And the company wasn't too liberal about doing that. We got such raises as five cents and seven cents and a dime. And maybe the most I've ever saw there was 15 cents on an hour. Mm -hmm. Would you say that the union did make a difference? made all the difference in the world. Without the union, they would run off anybody they want to and do what they wanted to do. They probably would pay different rates of wages for different people, when I mean different people, or blacks would always be underpaid, but the union made it so where blacks receive what whites receive doing the same type of work. So the union also made a difference in seniority, whereas that if you had uh, a senior over another person, whether they were white or black, the union saw to it that you got what was just for you by applying the senior as it's supposed to be applied. Mm -hmm. If not had been for the union, then other workers might have had an advantage of it. Mm -hmm. um, what community did you live in at that time during the 50s? Oh, 10th Avenue, and uh, the address was... Uh, 3rd and 19, 10th Avenue North. Hmm. So that, is that Norwood? That's the edge of Norwood, right at the edge of Norwood. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, how would you describe that community? The makeup, the racial makeup, the occupations that people had? Most of the people in that community was ordinary working people, wasn't any highly educated people, um, on fair and low salaries. There wasn't anybody that I know that earned what I would consider a decent area or made enough money to live in the type of community that they should and ought to have been able to live in. Uh -huh. So most of those people probably lived and worked in that particular area? Worked in that area, and there were other areas that they worked in besides there. Uh -huh. uh, probably most over town, but the type of people lived in there, they didn't earn too much money. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, what was your community's relationship to the Birmingham Police Department? 
There was no relationship at that time to the Birmingham Police Department because the Birmingham Police Department was lily white. There wasn't any blacks on the police department, and the police wasn't too nice to black people, period, in that area. I was stopped from going to work several times by the police just coming to work, and they searched me and uh, want to know where I came from and know where I was going. So if they didn't, they didn't find no gun, so they decided to let me go on home. Right. And there were times that I come out the plant to my car, and the police passed on the street, and if you see you getting in the car, they would turn around and stop and question you, and you just got off work. We had to go to the company and talk to the company concerning how rude the police were towards the workers when they get off at night. See, at one time I was working from 3 to 11, and when you get off at 11 o'clock and take a bath, it's 1130. You get to your car, it's about 20 minutes to 12. So the police was on a rampage at that time, and they wasn't too nice to black people at all. And this is in the 50s? Yes. And uh, what did the company say when you would go to them to t and, and inform about what the police was doing? They called the police department, and uh, they talked to maybe, I don't know, Jimmy Moore was chief of police at that time, and they said that the police wouldn't bother us anymore. So they lightened up. They weren't quite as bad as they had been. They had been following fellas all the way to the gate uh, on the 11th to 7th shift. Whenever they got off at night, there was a row of houses that black people stayed just beyond the plant. And down that street was a dirt street. And usually when you come out of the gate, if the police wasn't coming down the street, they was coming from another direction for some employees. And they were intimidated by the police. What plant was this? This was Alabama Cement Tower, owned by uh, McCullough Institute. Okay. Why, would, why were they harassing workers at that point? I don't know all the answers to the question why they're harassing workers, but I do think that uh, they want to know where you're going if you were away from the plant, where you're going at that time of night. It appeared to me that black people didn't have the rights to be on the street at that time of night. Because most time when I went home from work, or if I didn't go up the railroad track or drive my car, I was intimidated by the police. But if I drove my car, uh, I might miss them. But if I walked and went up the street, most likely I'd run into the police before I get home. And if I ran into the police before I got home, they would stop me and ask questions. Were you ever arrested? No. Were you a member of any community organizations? Not at that particular time, I wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, but later, you would get involved in a number of organizations. Right. Let me ask you, how and why did you get involved in the Civil Rights Movement? Well, when I was in the Armed Forces, I had a battery commander who was a, captain, was a lawyer in civilian life, and he was a captain in the Armed Forces. And he looked over the payroll and found that we were drawing maybe nine, ten dollars a month. And he felt that that was too much money. We didn't need that much money. So he called a formation and asked, did anybody want to join NAACP? He said it was two dollars to join NAACP. And when he got through explaining it, a fellow by the name of Willie J. Whittings walked out the line and I walked out. And he said, all you want to join NAACP, go to my office and I'll write you up and give you a card. So he was this wrote, a white officer or a black officer? Black officer. Okay. He wrote us up and gave us a card to become a member of the NAACP, and that happened in 1944 overseas. You said that he looked at the, the payroll and you were making $10 a Some were making 10 some were making more. Thought, but he didn't think that we should get that much money. So he felt like that we'd give $2 to that to the NAACP because they were fighting a fight back in the United States of America. Right. They had had some race riots in Georgia and, and Detroit and around, and the NAAC was fighting because of a, people were put in jail unjustified. So $10 money. a week was ten dollars a month. Big, a month was big money at that time? Well, he thought it was because we were overseas. And uh -huh. when you get overseas in the armed forces, some of the things that you have to buy in the United States of America, such as soap, tooth powder, and the things that a person need, the government give them to you. 
So you really don't have a lot to spend the money for unless you're in a place where you can go to town and where the ladies are. And we wasn't right where the ladies were. We out in the jungle. So he decided that uh, we were throwing too much money. Uh-huh. That's how so, me get involved in. So how many of you joined the NACP at that time? It was about 20 uh-huh. joined the NACP at so, that time. So that was your first encounter with with the civil rights organization? First encounter. Okay. Well, what, what did you do as a result of being a member while you were in service? Wasn't anything I could do until I got back out of the service. And when I got back out of the service, I joined, there was a NAACP chapter in Titusville, headed by Reverend T.L. Lane. So when I got out of the service, I joined that chapter and started working with that chapter. What year did you get out of service? Uh, 47. Mm-hmm. So from 47 to 56, you were actively involved with the NACP? Yes, yeah, right. What, what did you do? Well, we went to meetings, and we had a, a situation in Birmingham where a uh, policeman, wife, got in a, a parking place with a black man that worked at Sipico by the name of Parker, and we was having some meetings. So what happened is that I guess she told her husband, and the police is rest Parker. He was take, Parker was. Uh, they had an argument about a a parking spot. A parking space. Okay. okay. And they rest Parker and put him in jail. And sometime during that night or the next night, they went to jail and beat Parker up in jail. And the NAACP got off of that particular case. And that come direct involved. And at the same time, there were some houses being bombed on Center Street, all the way up from maybe 11th Avenue up the top of Center Street Hill. There were three or four houses that had been bombed. And the NAACP was all the legal organization that we had in this town at that particular time to fight for the victims. Why were those homes being bombed at that time? All I can say, the perpetrators bombed them because they didn't want black people to live in that community. That was a white community that was turning, that black folk had started to move into. Right. So those homes that blacks were moving into were being bombed. Right. Uh Uh, So this is actually prior to the development of the Alabama Christian movement. Right. In 1956, then, the NACP is outlawed from operating in the state. What happens then? But then NAACP was outlawed in 56. John Patterson was the Attorney General of the State of Alabama. Then the leaders got together and organized an organization called Alabama Christian Human Rights. We met at Smith and Garrison Funeral Home and we discussed it. And we discussed it again. We got a charter. And we set a meeting to be at Sardis Baptist Church on. June the 5th, 1956, and that was the born of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. So we started to fight in segregation then, and I was involved in any number of things. Yeah, were you involved in the very first meetings? The very first the meeting movement? that I had on the June 5th at Sardis Baptist Church. Right. What, uh, what was your role? I was just, uh, we were just getting it organized then. Mm-hmm. The, the uh, organization had not been set up, and the officers had to be appointed and elected. And after the officers was appointed and elected, then we got a chance to go. It was about three meetings before we got all the officers appointed. Mm-hmm. Did you serve in any official capacity? Were you, were you an officer at the time? Yeah, I was a board member. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you attended then the mass meetings regularly? Yeah, regularly. How would you describe the typical mass meeting? Well, a typical mass meeting was as many people as probably could get in a church at that particular time. And we discussed the problems of black people, what we had to do, because it was crucial in this town at that particular time. Uh, Blacks could not hardly vote. It was hardly, hardly possible for black people to vote. It was hardly possible for black people to live in certain communities without the houses being bombed. It was hardly possible for black people to have a nice automobile up and down the street without being intimidated by the policemen. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And at the same time, we, as we went on, uh, 
Bethel Baptist Church was bombed. And later on, after Bethel Baptist Church was bombed, 16th Street Church was bombed as we went along. Mm -hmm. um, and then, before then, we had to set up clinics. So what we did was try to get the, there was a very few people registered to vote at that particular time. Mm -hmm. And it was so hard for people to be, become registered until we had to set up a way to teach them. And we they had a questionnaire of about maybe 50, 45 questions. Probably took a college graduate to pass the board to be registered. And so many people was turned down, not all of them on education, because they didn't ask legal questions. We had all the answers to the legal questions. But they asked questions that you probably wouldn't know. For an instance, they asked women, when was your first child born? Then they asked her, when did you get married? Then they asked women, Oh, you show sure all them children are your husband's children? And they turned them down on more questions. And mm -hmm. we kept records on those that they turned down. Uh, and we, over a period of maybe three years, we had something like 40,000 folks was turned down by the voter registers. Mm -hmm. Was this at, uh, as a result of your work with the NACP or the Alabama Christian Movement? This was the Alabama Christian Movement, but okay. uh, NACP led me up to this. Okay. NACP so, was out at this time. I noticed that you were, uh, you were credited with being responsible for over 17,000 people. Right. Uh, be registered right. as voters. And this is during the Alabama Christian Movement period. Right. Hmm. That's, that's impressive. At the meetings, were Birmingham police present? Yes, at all meetings, Birmingham police were present. What was that purpose there? To watch and to see and to hear what was going on. Hmm. And were they welcomed? Uh, yeah, we welcomed them. We, we thought they shouldn't have been there. A lot of times we made statements to rather that they should have been somewhere trying to catch some crook or we were Christian people trying to get our rights and freedom, but they didn't pay any attention. They were at the meetings on time every Monday night. Hmm. Didn't anybody do anything to them? They enjoyed it, so they got where they laughed, but they realized that they should have been in the wrong place, and they was in the wrong place watching God, people. Hmm. Did others in your family participate? Yeah, one or two. Mm -hmm. um, did any of them go to jail? You were never arrested, right? Or were no, well, I was stayed out for purpose. Mm -hmm. Or uh, being a board member, we had to look out for others. Mm -hmm. I would have been arrested like all the rest of them, but I was out for a purpose, mm -hmm. to help get others out of jail and what have you. Okay. Were you one of those that helped to raise funds? Right. Okay. Did you ever do any speaking uh, in Birmingham or outside of Birmingham for the purpose of raising funds? Not too much speaking for raising funds, but mm -hmm. for the event of the civil rights movement, I spoke all the time. Spoke at the mass meetings every Monday night mm, okay. for years. Mm. Um, how did other members of your family react to your participation, the level of involvement that you had in the movement? Well, when I first got started, I got a little kick from my family. They said a few things to me that, uh, and I didn't think too much of it because they didn't quite understand what was going on and what was involved. So I tried to explain to my family, and, but they didn't accept all I said. So they saw they wasn't going to stop me, so they quit talking to me about it. So I just kept on. So finally, they started coming in one by one. I finally got them all into the movement. Mm. So everybody eventually would get involved as a result of your involvement. Right. Tell me about some of the incidents that you, you may have witnessed, the kinds of things that were happening during this time. Well, an incident happened. The Shuttleworth children was on a bus coming to Birmingham, and uh, they were pulled off a bus in Gaston, Alabama, and put in jail. And we formed a, we knew that it's a possibility it wouldn't be safe for one or two people to go to Gaston and try to get the children out. So we had a little convoy, five or six cars, and I was driving the car belonging to Mr. Colonel Stone Johnson. And we went to Gaston. I had the papers, uh, bonds, to get the children out of jail. 
And when I got to Gaston, Alabama, the bond, it was denied me to get the children out of jail. So I couldn't get the children out of jail because they wouldn't accept the bonds. And they turned the bonds down, even though it was signed by responsible people and people in authority. But the officials in Gaston wouldn't accept this. So we had to come back to Birmingham without the children and go back at another time to get the children. Why were, they, why were they arrested? Because they refused to give up their seats to somebody on the bus. In other words, they were sitting um, toward the front and wouldn't give their seats up for whites that had gotten on the bus. How many children were there and, how, and what were their ages? Oh, they were young. They ran from maybe 13 or to about 17 years old. Hmm. Well, what happened? Did you eventually go back and you... Yeah, it, another group went back and, and they released them, but they had to do some work, had to get some lawyers and go into a few things in order to get them out of jail. Hmm. Was it a fact that uh, they had to get a bondsman from Gaston rather than using the bondsman from Birmingham? Right. So, mm -hmm. so they were really trying to get business for, for their own people in their own town you know, and, and, and would not recognize what um, the, the bonds person from, from Birmingham. Is that correct? That is partly true, but I don't think it's altogether true because, after all, Birmingham is not a long ways from gas in Alabama. So they could have accepted the bond since it was a state of Alabama. It's been another state. I might have would have went along with them doing it for that purpose. But being this close to Birmingham, mm -hmm. I don't accept it. I yeah. think that they could have or let us have the children. It sure. was some ill will involved why they didn't let us have it. No, absolutely. What church were you a member of? New Hope Baptist Church. New Hope. Um, was your church involved? Uh, your church or your pastor involved with the with the movement? Part of them, a few, quite a few members of our church was involved, and my pastor was also, uh -huh. and his wife. So then he really didn't have any any difficulty because there were other pastors who were not involved. Is that is that correct? Sure, there was a lot of pastors not involved. Uh -huh. um, so your church then being involved, that encouraged your minister to be involved. And I'm assuming that you were partly responsible for that as a leader in your church. Were you, were you a deacon in the church? No, I wasn't a deacon at that time. Okay. My pastor was a brilliant man. And when he came, he talked about registering voting. Or oh, when I joined the church, after I got out of the army, I was a member of the church before I went. But mm -hmm. after being away a number of years, I had to rejoin the church when I got out of the army. And he was from Atlanta, Georgia, and that was part of his talk, registering and voting. So there was no problem to get Reverend involved. I heard him say something that I respect him really high for. He'd taken money out of his own pocket and had a clinic at New Hope Baptist Church for the members and other people to come in and learn how to go down and register and vote. At that particular time, we had some members in New Hope Church was in age, something like 50, 60 years old. And they went down to vote, and we had a poll tax in the city of Birmingham, and they had to pay poll tax from the age they were 21 up to 56 or 60 or 70 years of age. Some of them paid 30 and $40 back poll taxes before they could vote in that church. And the chairman of the deacon board was an elderly man, pretty close to 70 years old not there. And he paid his poll tax, and they charged him poll taxes from 21 years to 70 before he had the privilege to vote. Mm. And there were more than him. Uh, Deacon Cliff Watkin, after Mr. Ben Grisdy passed on, Deacon Cliff Watkin, become the chairman of the deacon board. When he became the chairman of the deacon board, he uh, went down and registered, and he had to pay a lot of money. Mr. C.C. C. Jones, he was a deacon and at New Open, had been there a long time. I understand he paid 30 some dollars and just on go the story, whereas at the Board of Registers, or oh, make you pay all that back tax for the lit blacks vote. Uh -huh. Who was your minister at that time? Reverend Herman Stone. Herman Stone. Um, 
You suggested that the issues, some of the issues that were involved with the movement at the time was police har harassment, voter registration, um, actually the kids that you talked about uh, with, with Reverend Shuttlesworth, of course the schools were an issue. Were there other issues that the movement dealt with that you, were, that you remember vividly? Uh, oh, those, yeah. Uh, what about the buses? Did you yeah, have any I am uh, riding buses? the buses in the city of Birmingham. Yes. I was downtown one day, not too long after the Supreme Court handed out a decision that the buses was integrated. You know, in the segregated days, you rode the bus in the back of the bus. And no, no, make no difference how crowded the bus was uh, with blacks. They didn't let but so many blacks ride. They put a board there, then the blacks could not ride up front. They had to stand in the back. But then after the Supreme Court ruled on the bus, I was downtown and caught the bus. And when I caught the bus, I sit in white section, white event, sitting just on the bus. Didn't many people sit down behind me, but when I got where I was supposed to get off at, the bus driver didn't let me off. So we went another block. So I got out, took my pencil and paper, and took the number of the bus. And his number, he was kind of nasty about it. It wasn't a law then. Uh, we had to go in and negotiate that the buses was, bus drivers were still doing the same thing now as they're doing in the segregation days, not allowing people. They couldn't put the boards in the buses, but they were being asked to write on for a while. Uh -huh. We had to go to Tennessee and get some white students from a school in Tennessee and bring them to Birmingham and put in the back of the buses in order to try to make a total integration. Uh -huh. So you actually solicited assistance from outside of Birmingham. Right, we had to From yeah. young white students. Right. Who would actually sit in the back and blacks would sit in the front. Right. What was the reaction then to, to the, uh, of the bus drivers? The and bus drivers didn't become nice until the Alabama Christian Movement board meeting met with this, the bus company and the city of Birmingham, the city attorney and the bus company and told the bus company that what the bus drivers was doing. So the bus company said that they would tell the bus drivers, just drive the bus, don't have any fear with the passengers. Then it would start beginning to let up. But before then, they was not actually harassing, but they were making inconvenient for the passengers. And even in the segregated day, it was terrible. It was almost unbearable in the segregated day. Whereas if you had some time if the bus was crowded, you had to go had to go in the back door of the bus. Couldn't even go in the front door. And, and stand up wherever you had to go to and get off, not having the privilege to sit down, even though there were seats available that you could sit down, but the bus driver was just too nasty to move the board, so you had to stand up until you get where you were going. Is it true that you'd actually have black people standing up on the bus and many times there were few whites on the bus, but in order to get off, even though you were standing in front of the, the back door, you had to walk back through all of the people and get off the bus rather than being able to get off on the front. Right. Mm -hmm. That's, those were some tough times. Right. Uh, were you associated with Reverend Shuttlesworth yeah. when he went to uh, integrate Phillips High School? No, I was working that day. Hmm. Uh, what do you remember about uh, um, that, that? They beat him up, and uh, Reverend Abraham Woods drove the car from the scene. Reverend Pfeiffer drove the car to the scene. Reverend Pfeiffer was, at that time, the second vice president of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Mm -hmm. So he drove Reverend Shuttleworth to Phillip High School. We had to plan it, but I had to work and I couldn't get off. Mm -hmm. If I had, I could have got off, I would have been there. I got off that afternoon and uh, they had taken Reverend Shuttleworth home because he was beaten up. Mm -hmm. uh, the perpetrators was round with rocks and chains in the hand. And there were people from my family and friends that I know were there to testify to the fact 
what the perpetrator did when Reverend Shuttleworth got the car. Then they crowded around him to beat him up, and they did beat him up. Mm-hmm. And they actually stuck, uh, stabbed his wife. Yeah, mm-hmm. and yep. said all kind of nasty words. The language was bad that the perpetrators used because mm-hmm. they used the word nigger, mm-hmm. and there was no such thing as a nigger. That's just what they wanted to use to discredit black people. Mm-hmm. It's ironic that today Phillips High School is is 99.9% black. Right. Uh, 1961, Bull Connor made a statement because there were freedom riders that were, were going throughout the South. And he, was, he suggested that the freedom riders had more sense than to come to Birmingham. Uh, of course, the freedom riders did come into Birmingham. Were you involved in that at all because I know that there were those who left here and went to Anniston to help bring people down. Did you have any involvement in? in Not in the Freedom Riders because I was working during the time. They come at around 11 o'clock that day and I had a job Mm -hmm. and I wasn't able to be involved but I know about it. Uh Um, 62, Miles College students got involved in a selective buying campaign. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Can you tell me how that was developed? Well, they they come to the movement. We had a young people uh, division in the movement. And in the movement, we had a director as to what we do from day and from time to time, as to whether we uh, would stage any buying campaign, whatever it might be, we was directed from the movement. So my college students stamped it buying campaign by going down in the city to buy different products at different places. At that particular time, there were places in the stores that black had sell was segregated. I bought the better quality shoes not because I was able to buy them, because I didn't want to be segregated. The store that sold the lesser quality shoes, they had a special place for you to sit down. They take you back into the store where would nobody be unless it be one or two blacks. All the whites would be up front where you could buy a pair of shoes at a reasonable price. But where you had to pay rat smarter money for the shoe, then they wasn't so segregated. You could sit down wherever anybody else sat. So that caused me to pay a little bit more money for my shoe because I didn't want to go back there. Because in two or three stores I went into, they carry you back in the back to sit you down to try on a pair of shoes. And I didn't... Like that. Do you remember what stores those were? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, Regal cool. Shoe Store, yeah. Flag Brother Shoe Store, mm-hmm. and Bob Young Shoe Store. Was Odom Biles and White one of those that you, no. you could go into that one, right? You could go in and sit down where you wanted to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, 63, of course, with the demonstrations in April and May. Right. What do you remember most about that period? Well, we marched to the city jail on Sunday and they wouldn't had to hose pipes and water and were prayed and what some of the preachers asked them to. We didn't want to go any further and just up to the jail to pray and they refused to let us go. And so some started walking off and all of us walked off and we went on to the jail. But the fire department was out there with holes, pipes to keep us from going to the jail just to pray. Were you ever among any of the marchers when they turned the hoses on and turned the dogs loose? I was with all of that. Is that right? Yes. Can you uh, just sort of explain what that was like, facing that, the, the, the dogs and the hoses? Facing, well, we had a lot of children and vicious dogs, German police dogs. And the hose pipes were strong that they turned on, on any number of people. I might say it might run into thousands of people mm-hmm. where they were children and knocked children down in the street. And at the same time, sick the dogs on the people. And the dogs had, people had to fight the dogs off, but they didn't have anything to fight the dogs with. But at the same time, people were somewhat devastated because of the fire hoses and because of the dogs. And the police did not anything to keep the dogs off the people. Nor did the uh, fire department turn the water off. 
They were doing this to run the people. It was a lot of ill will. It was a tragic situation in Birmingham at that time. But did, did this dissuade people from getting involved with the movement? No, it had increased people from getting involved. Mm. Instead of driving people from the movement, people came more and more and more. Mm. Were you ever involved in any, uh, any of the movement outside of Birmingham? Yeah, I went to Selman and marched a little, but I didn't make the whole trip, but I went and marched some. Mm -hmm. Were there ever um, any times when you, well, were you associated closely with Dr. King? Yes. Uh, what was your relationship? Just a good friend, and, and we, Dr. King sent for me to come to Montgomery, Alabama. I am the person that come up with the 10 reasons why black people should vote. And he looked at it and he thought it was very good. So he sent to call Reverend Shuttleworth and told him to tell me or to bring me to Montgomery. He wanted to talk with me. So Reverend Shuttleworth and Reverend Gardner and Reverend Charles Billup and Mrs. Lola Hendricks and myself went to Montgomery to Dr. Martin Luther King establishment. He had office there. And we discussed the 10 reasons why that uh, black people should vote. And Dr. King became a good friend of mine during the uh, civil rights struggle. We discussed a lot of things. And even during the demonstration here in Birmingham, we sat down at the old Smith and Gaston building, maybe till 12, 1, and 2 o'clock in the morning, deciding what to do for Birmingham. Because we had 3,000 people in jail, and we had run out of money. And so we got $50,000 from SCLC. And at that particular time, Reverend Ralph David Abernathy was a treasure. He gave us a check for $50,000 to help us get some of the people out of jail, but that wasn't a drop in the bucket. We couldn't get the people out of jail with $50,000 because the bonds was $2,000 for children. So we had to go to Atlanta and get a federal jury to hand down a decree in order to turn the children loose and let them go back to school. So... We put a lawyer on the plane and sent him to Atlanta and filed a case in Atlanta with an Fifth Circuit Appeals Court. What had happened in Birmingham, and he sent an order through the federal judge here. Judge Glenn was a federal judge at that particular time, and ordered him to put the children back in school. And that's how we got them out of jail, most of us. There were efforts made by individuals here in Birmingham to assist people in other parts of the country when they had difficulty where civil rights was concerned. Were you involved in any of those? Yes. Of those? What, what were you involved in? I went to Virginia to the shit out of schools into Virginia and want to charge the people $20 per child per week. And some black people had four, five, six, eight, nine, ten children and making 30, maybe $40 a week at the most, and they couldn't afford it, and it devastated the whole city of Norfolk, Virginia. We went to try to help and see what we could do to give them some aid as what should be done in the city of Virginia. You're suggesting they were closing the public school system? They closed the public school system down. And establishing? Private schools. And they, they would allow blacks to attend those private schools? If they could pay. If they could afford. Uh -huh. So you and others from here, was this with Dr. King? Um, Dr. King was this? in the hospital at that time where a woman had stopped him in the chest with a letter opener. So the other top officials taken over. Dr. C.K. Steele was vice president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Dr. Raph David Abernathy was treasure of SCLC, and uh, Reverend Sherwood was a board member. I don't know exactly what his position was, but in North of Virginia, he'd taken over, and we discussed what needed to be done. So we went out on the school ground and off ultimatum to the city, and the press covered this, and we prayed, and there were some perpetrators all around. We didn't know exactly what the perpetrators would do, but when we got to or praying, and we marched away, but we worked with the people that was in charge of the movement in that city. 
to do the best that we possibly could to help them figure out what should be done. On the local scene, what benefits did you, your family, and the community realize as a result of the movement? I don't really think we benefited no more from the fact that that there was a a chance for young people and there was a change for the coming generations that what we went through that they wouldn't have to go through with it and would make a better place for all of us to live. I think that's all we actually profit from it. You, so you think that it it became a better place to live as a result of, of the movement? Right. If you were in control of the movement and could go back and change some things, what would you change? I don't think I would change anything much different from what actually happened. If I could, was in control of the movement and could go back, I think at that particular time, what went on and how it went on, it wasn't a thing that you could plan from year to year and from month to month. You had to deal with it as it come up. It was a day-to-day -day thing. What would come up today, you deal with it today. What would come up tomorrow, you deal with it tomorrow. If it would be that way now, you would probably have to deal with it the same way. The opposition was so great at that particular time, uh -huh. and we didn't have monies that we should have had, but we had to take what we did have. The lawyers wasn't, wasn't too lean with us, so we had to, a lot of things that we would have done that we couldn't do because of lack of finances. So right now, if I had to go back, I probably would have to do it the same way because in a civil rights struggle, what happened today may not happen tomorrow, so you have to deal with it a different way. So I think that a lot of people felt like in that day that we should have had a, a course to travel, but we couldn't have no course to travel. The problem was that things come up different. There were plans to do this, plans to do that. Whatever you do, somebody do something just the object. You do something, somebody do something just the object. And this kind of thing kept us always planning, always planning. You never know directly what you would do. Some people would say that the movement died with Dr. King in 1968, and no. there is no movement going on today. How would you react to that? I think that's wrong. There are movements going on today. A lot of people wouldn't be receiving what they're receiving. A lot of people wouldn't be living like they are living. And uh, the circumstance of life wouldn't be with the dark skin, the people, and a lot of whites if there was not a movement in this country, even today. There's an attack now on affirmative action. Yes. Um, how do you view that? Well, we need affirmative action. There might be some parts in affirmative action could be eliminated, but not affirmative action. Affirmative action has brought us a long way. If it had not been affirmative action, there are a lot of things that exist that they would not exist, and a lot of jobs that people have, they would not have if it hadn't been for affirmative action. It might be that the people are disagreeing with a whole affirmative action. There might be some parts that they need to cut out, eliminate, or revise. It's possible that affirmative action could revive, be revised and do a better job than it's doing now. But you still need affirmative action. Well... How would you assess the Birmingham movement? How successful was it? What were the accomplishments? The accomplishments of the Birmingham movement was fine. It, we didn't accomplish all the things that we maybe should have. or didn't accomplish. I know we didn't accomplish all the things we wanted to accomplish, but we accomplished a lot in the process of what we did do. Uh, there are a lot of things need to be accomplished now that we didn't accomplish then, and probably we couldn't have accomplished them then. But the Birmingham movement was a great asset to Birmingham and to underprivileged people. I've heard uh, at least one student of, the, of those days suggest that Birmingham, particularly the school system, was integrated by the same mentality that it segregated the school system. They didn't say the same people, but the same mentality. Uh, how would you react to that? I don't agree with that. Okay. Because 
the black people weren't in the position to segregate nor integrate. White people was in a position to segregate the schools. They were in a position to integrate the schools. Now, all the mentality, I have no knowledge of it, but we know at that particular time that we only could apply, could have asked for the law to be handed down. The people that was in a position to hand down the law was whites. The people that did segregate the schools was whites. Uh -huh. What was the result of the integration of schools uh, in terms of, of black schools? How did, how did the integration affect black schools? I don't think it did a whole lot of infection to black schools. It might hope improve black students because I'm not familiar with all the things they taught mm -hmm. at that particular time because I wasn't a member of the Board of Education. And I still don't know. But at least it gave children an opportunity to go to schools closer than a lot of kids that wasn't probably able to go to these one or two schools that they had in Birmingham by integrating the school that put a high school near wherever black children live and they could attend that school, which made it better on the parents' budget and made it better on the child. So in making it better on the parents' budget and the child, the child had a better opportunity of learning because he could be, in all, most instances, exposed to some knowledge that he wasn't exposed to be, at the beginning. And being exposed to knowledge would give you a better opportunity to learn. So I think maybe integration done quite a bit for black students by giving them a better opportunity to learn by exposing them a different type of knowledge. Okay. Is there anything else that you'd like to add that we hadn't dealt with today? We've covered a lot of ground. Is there anything that I have not asked that you would yeah. like to? Okay. I would like to say that during that struggle, we had to to take people to the voter register and they be turned down and couldn't vote and couldn't register. And we had to set up clinics throughout the city to teach our people how to register. And after teaching them how to register, when they registered, come back to the clinic and teach them how to vote. Because during that period of time, I remember that in general elections you have maybe at that time, 100 or 135 people running for 30 officers or 25 officers. And you had to pick over 100 and some people to choose 25 people. And if you vote poorly lever by the wrong person's name, the vote wouldn't count. And you used machines then, and a lot of people weren't so familiar with machines. They allowed you three minutes in the machine. And I've been in the line many times when there are other members of other races be in the machine 10 or 15 minutes, nobody say nothing. But when blacks was in the machine, over three minutes, somebody will tell them they're spending too much time. And I've had spoke myself to the pollers at the polling place in the precinct, uh, give them a little bit more time, and you're a little unfair. And sometimes they wouldn't, sometimes they wouldn't. This was a handicap to black people in order to cast their ballot, because you have to be very good to select 30 folks out of 135 people voting. Sometime we had six to ten folks. I remember in the state of Alabama, ten folk ran for governor of the state of Alabama, and ten for lieutenant governor, and six for one job, one particular position, maybe five for another. During this, you select maybe 25 positions that people go into public office, and you have only three minutes to do this, and blacks was deprived of the rights of staying in the polls over three minutes. And there were others from other races could stay in there maybe 12, 14 minutes. And sometimes the lines at that particular time would be three or four lines, depends on how many machines you had. And if you had 10 machines, and that's in a major election, the building where you would be full of people, and on the outside you'd have maybe a line with two or three around the corner. So the polls had to be open to 9, 10 o'clock at night to get all the folks open. They close the doors at 7 o'clock. And if all is not in the building at 7 o'clock, the rest don't get a chance to register. That has happened to black folks, mm. as well as whites, mostly blacks. Last year, 
two years ago as we viewed uh, South Africa voting for the first time. Did that remind you at all of, of Birmingham? Yes. In the same kind of lines that existed, probably even larger lines in South Africa. And much more difficult. They were voting with a ballot to push in a hole, just mark it with a pencil in South Africa and push it in a box. But in Birmingham, Alabama, you had a machine sitting over there that had been a program with people names on it. And you had to look on that machine and find the person's name that you was looking for and pull a lever by that name, which oh. took much more time to do it. And you had to read real fast. And, and you couldn't hardly make any mistakes because if you made any mistakes, then the ballot wouldn't count. So you would lose that ballot. We lose some ballots during that time. Mm -hmm. That was somewhat unfair to a lot of voters, and especially to blacks too. Mm -hmm. And that has changed as a result of the kinds of protests that were made during that particular time. Right. right. Okay. Is there anything else that you'd like to, to say? Yes. The people that was turned down for voting, we noticed in Alabama, there was a poll tax in on people. I said a little about it, but I want to say a little more about it. The poll taxes that was enclosed, if you were poor and didn't have the money to pay your poll tax for a certain time of the year, then you didn't get a chance to vote. Your poll tax had a deadline to it. And if you didn't pay the poll tax by the deadline, then you couldn't vote that year. This was, poll taxes was payable every year whether your election was not, then poll tax was a dollar and a half to civilians that uh, had no military. And poll tax was to poor, a lot of times, couldn't afford to pay the money for poll tax because food was a problem, housing was a problem. So this way, a lot of poor people didn't get a chance to even register to vote. Well, and if they registered, they couldn't pay the poll tax, they still couldn't vote. What was the purpose of the poll tax? I don't know exactly what the state used it for, uh -huh. but they charged people to vote, that's all I can say. I wouldn't be correct because I don't know. Uh -huh. The voter registers received the poll taxes, but what they use it for, uh -huh. I have no knowledge of it. Some have suggested that it was used to keep black people from voting because that it way might have been, afford. but I can't say for definite it was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I certainly appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedule and coming and talk with us today, because what you have done for us, you've helped us to put another piece of the puzzle together. Thank you. And we certainly thank you for that for that time, and uh, you'll be hearing from us again. Appreciate you having me. Thank you. Thank you. Sweet and